hope everybody's Thanksgiving was a blessed time with family. Yes, and had a good rest, right? So now we're ready to get into celebrating the birth of our Savior, right? That starts right after Thanksgiving, right? Some of us were in it right after Halloween. But uh, I want to take a moment to send an extra thank you to Beverly and Margaret and Mallory. If you guys noticed the, uh, the trees when you came into the church, they worked hard on that yesterday, so I want to give them a, a big thank you. And then, of course, Crystal and Susan, we're not done yet, but you can see they've done some, a, a beautiful job in here. So if you see them when we, when we do our meet and greet, if you'll take a moment to just thank them for their work. Uh, it is, it is a, a beautiful arrangement that they have done to remind us uh, this is the season where we are thankful for our Savior. Yes? Amen? Amen. Are you guys ready to worship the Lord? Amen. If you would please stand to your feet. And I'll ask uh, um, Crystal if you would say a prayer. Amen. Amen, amen. Hosanna to the King of kings and Lord of lords. Our offering today, we'll pick up. We have baskets in the back, plates in the front. Um, and this is a time where we encourage folks to go around and mingle and show them your smile and tell them how glad you are to see them. We're in the season, the flu season, so some may not want to have a handshake. That's fine. Show them your smile. They can still see that and tell them you're glad to see them. Our offering today goes for general expense. Um, Sister Joyce, would you say a prayer for our offering? Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. First Peter, second chapter, the Bible tells us that Christ on the cross bore my sin in his body. Mm. That I might live unto righteousness. Amen. You know what that brings? Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's read our scripture today. This is from Psalm 131 through 5. Would you read with me? Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in His Word, I put my hope. Amen. Hallelujah. In Christ and His Word, we have an everlasting hope that will not end because Christ is eternal and His sacrifice is enough. Amen. Let's rejoice in that today. Lift your voices in praise and thanksgiving. Father, we thank You today, Lord, for what You're doing in our lives. Thank You for the mercies that You've shown us. Thank You, God, that in your word our hope is secure thank you Christ that in your sacrifice Lord it is enough to make me righteous in my belief in you Lord and I thank you today that God our sins are forgiven in Jesus Christ hallelujah and praise his holy name thank the Lord amen I'm so grateful for the Lord oh how lost we are without him We're in the book of uh, 1 Samuel. We'll be talking, and if you have your Bibles, if you turn to chapter 15, that's where we will be. And at first I was a little, I don't know, a little concerned because, you know, we jumped into 1 Samuel and I didn't think far enough ahead and this is, we're marching up to Christmas season and I'm wondering, you know, how, how are we going to fit 1 Samuel into the into the nativity story. <laughs> but really, if you look at it, if, 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 you, if you really look at it, 1 Samuel is on the road to Bethlehem. I mean, from Genesis to Revelation, it's about Jesus. Amen. From beginning to end, it's all about Him. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and as we go through these next several chapters, in Matt and in First Samuel, we'll see God 
has, has this roadmap leading to Bethlehem. We're talking about facing our giants. And I'm going to read uh, verse 24 and 25 first, and then we'll skip back to, to verse 1. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. Brother Rick, how would you say prayer? Father, how grateful we are today for the presence of our Savior. Thank you, Lord, that you are near to your children. We pray, Lord, today that your presence would remain as we worship you now in the learning of your word. I pray, Lord, make it clear to us, Father, make it so clear to us today through your servant. God bless Pastor Scott. Give him, Lord, strength and anointing for this task we pray in Christ's name. Man. One of my favorite TV show series is it's, it's an old black and white. You might be familiar with it. It's uh, Mom and Paul Kettle. I um, watched many of those episodes on Sunday afternoon. <laughs> they used to have it on, on Sunday afternoon a lot. And uh, I love, it's about, if you haven't seen Ma and Paul Kettle, some of our younger folks back there probably have no idea who Ma and Paul Kettle is. It's, it's about two, two poor folk. They're, they're farmers. They live on a farm and they have 15 kids and they're a wild bunch. They're a wild bunch. And they, uh, they experience a lot of hijinks together and um, they get themselves into issues and then out of issues. And it's actually, it's, it's a show that I enjoy watching. In fact, I bought the CD set. <laughs> that, yeah, I mean. There's one particular episode, I think, because in, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, there's so many things we could mine from, from this chapter. And we just don't have the time to do it justice here today. But what I think the Lord wanted us to hear to me, I see in this episode, this particular episode of Ma and Paul Kettle. And what it had to do is one of their sons, his name was Elwin. He entered this essay contest to a particular magazine about farming, modern farming techniques. And it was for this, this big scholarship to go to college. Well, Ma and Paul Kettle, they have 15 kids. They live on a farm. Paul is not much of a help if you've seen it. And so Ma works herself to death. They don't have a lot of money. And so this scholarship uh, money is, it would, be, would mean a lot to Elwin if he would, was to win this, this, this contest. And so he entered into the essay. Elwin uh, was a great writer, though. In fact, he had a great imagination. And as he, as he wrote this essay, he began to represent the family farm in a way that didn't really represent the farm. He really dressed it up in the essay. Well, he became uh, one of the two finalists. It was between him and, and another gal, and the editor of the magazine wanted to come and inspect the farm. And they read his essay, and they looked outside, and they saw the farm, and they realized two and two were not matching up. And so the whole family, they pitched in together and they created these awesome one-sided buildings. <laughs> and for much of the show, it was just their job to keep the editor in front of the, of the facade. Don't let him peek around the back. And so that was a lot. And they, they would do all kinds of things. You know, they would have uh, the children up on top of the roof of the, of the house with hoses to spray in the air, and they're like, oh, it's raining, we can't go outside and inspect today, and all kinds of things like that. But to me, that episode represents in a, in a big way of what's going on in chapter 15 here. And so let's, let's pick it up here at the beginning with verse 1. Samuel said to Saul, 
I am the one, the Lord, sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel. When they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt, now go, attack the Amalekites, and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. This is a pretty disturbing start to this chapter. To the modern ear, when we hear something like this, it's hard for us to, to understand really what's going on. I think we'd be remiss for me to just skip on past this if we didn't unpack a little bit about what's going on here. And, and what I'm about to say isn't going to do justice. You need to do an exhaustive study on your own. You need to seek the Lord on your own. But we need to understand that the Amalekites were a group of people that the Lord tells us they were ingrained in terrorism. That's who they were. Many nations have an import-export business and you can list what they export and what they import. And what the Amalekites exported was terrorism. And what they imported was the loot of anybody and everyone else. That's who they were. And the Lord tells us that He gave patience and He waited for a very long time for them to repent. We will only understand the Old Testament holy war sent from God if it's within a story that reveals God who is holy and is committed to eradicating sin and renewing His creation. Anything outside of that will make no sense to us at all. It's impossible to give full treatment to what happened here. But God remembers what the Amalekites did to the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. The, the Amalekites waited and, and picked at the children of Israel at the rear. If you know anything about the caravan as they came out of Egypt, who it was that was at the, the rear of the caravan, it was the elderly it was the handicapped. It was those who could not defend themselves. And the Amalekites attacked them. And God waited many, many years for them to repent. And God was going to use Saul and the Israelites as His holy justice for this group of people. It does not answer everything, and I don't pretend that it does. But nonetheless, we must, I, don't, I didn't want to gloss over this and just move on and pretend like it doesn't exist. There are many things about God's words that are uncomfortable for us. And if we don't know God and we don't understand where He's coming from, we'll miss the point. That nobody is innocent before the Lord. Nobody. Not one of us no matter how young, no matter how old, can stand before God and say, I'm innocent. No one can. And so I encourage you to seek God with all of your heart to come to a better and deeper understanding. See, this war was not a conquest. Saul and Israel were not supposed to look to enrich themselves from this war. They were to be God's instrument of justice. And that's what He laid out for Saul and the Israelites to do. And we pick up in verse 7 now. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Hamalah to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. And all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the cattle, the fat calves, the lambs, everything that was good. 
These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. If you're paying attention to what God is doing here, and Saul wasn't, the Israelite army, they were not. The very thing that God was punishing the Amalekites for doing is what Saul and the Israelites did. They killed the weak and they kept the best for themselves. The very thing that the Amalekites were doing that God wanted to judge, justice needed to be done to these group of people. And God chose the Israelites to be His instruments of justice. They did exactly what the Amalekites were doing. It's amazing how we can rationalize in our own hearts, in our own minds, just outright sin. We learned some time ago that God is never not working for us. God is also never not aware of our sins. He's never not aware of our sins. So we have this unique ability to cocoon ourselves in, in, in our own little prison. When we rationalize what we do, we see it on TV, we, we say to ourselves, you know, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Or we even convince ourselves, what I'm struggling with is what everybody struggles with. Right? So we... We, we cocoon ourselves away from the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And if we're not careful, we end up being trapped into our own little false narrative. And we'll begin to believe things that we never thought we would believe before. God's never not aware of what Saul was doing or not doing. So he tells Samuel, I got a message for you to deliver to Saul. He disobeyed. He sinned. Go tell him. So verse 12. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul. But he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. Saul has already begun his revisionist history program. It was God who issued the orders. It was God who issued the victory. It was God who was in control and in direction of everything the whole time. When things got messed up was when Saul turned from what God told him to do. That's when things got messed up. But he's erecting a monument, changing, he's revising history. Saul won this victory. Saul gets the credit for this. We already see things going on inside. And we see that, that Saul has begun to build a cocoon up. Inside himself, he's rationalizing all kinds of stuff. We can see this. We see this in ourselves, right? We can see this plainly in Saul. Listen. Listen to what Saul has to say when Samuel comes to him. Verse 13. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. It's almost laughable, isn't it? Samuel, he has a sarcastic sense of humor, and I love that about him. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? 
There was a, a book that we read with the boys one time, um, The Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. I don't know if you had the pleasure of reading uh, that book. It's, it's, it's a good book. I confess, a couple of chapters I had to go reread because I didn't totally understand what Sinclair Lewis was saying. But there's one that, one that stuck out to me, and, and, I, and, I, and I wonder sometimes if we if our concept of sin is so skewed and the, and the enemy dulls us to our sin in so many different ways that this one chapter, and basically if you don't know what the book is about, it's about these demons um, and they have these committee meetings and they come together about how they're going to trip up this individual from pursuing the Lord. So they're devising strategies of how they can trick him into uh, not following the Lord. And one of the demons in one of these meetings in, the chap- in one of the chapters that he, he wrote, he suggested, here's what we need to do. We need to make sin a joke. If we just get this individual to joke about sin and to laugh at sin, he will not look at it as serious as he did once before. And I can... I, I remember playing this out of my own self, right? And how many jokes about sin that I have made and laughed at and wondered, was God laughing at those jokes? See, we can really protect ourselves from the conviction of the Holy Spirit and build a little prison amongst ourselves. Part of us facing our giants our struggles, whatever it is we mentioned, it's different for everybody. One of the reasons why we struggle facing our giants is that we aren't totally honest with what's going on underneath. We're like Mom, Paul Kettle, and all them. We're going to put up a facade and it's going to look good from the outside. And as long as nobody inspects it, you know, I can come to church and I can sing songs and, and I can do all of these things on the outside. It's going to look immaculate. But underneath, there's still there's some issues. Because we all sin. But what do we do when we're confronted with it? Whether it's public, whether it's private, what do we do when we're confronted by the Holy Spirit when we've done wrong? We have an example here before us in Saul. Verse 15. Saul answered, The soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. See, at verse 14, when Samuel said, What is this, the animals that I hear? That was Saul's confrontation. That was the moment where Saul could have laid his head down and said, I sinned. That was the moment for him to repent when he was confronted. But see, Saul is so delusional. Saul is so wrapped up in his sin. Saul is so wrapped up in himself. Saul is so wrapped up in his false narrative that even with the animals lowing in the background, he can't see his sin. And so he defiantly digs his heels in and begins to pass the blame off onto someone else. But we know, God knows, God's never not aware. You know, Samuel didn't want to have anything to do with it. If you read the continuation of this in 16 and 17, Saul's beginning to ramble on, and Samuel's like, just stop! I don't want to hear it! And then Samuel lays this down onto him. Verse 22. Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. To heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, He has rejected you as king.
God knows what was going on in Saul's heart. See, in these days, to have a king from another nation that you have conquered in your prison, that was a wonderful status symbol. That was better than making you a Kardashian in those days. To have a king in your prison, that was a notch on your belt. We know what Saul was doing. Saul can fool the army. Saul can fool himself. But Saul can't fool God. And neither can we. And neither can we. Saul is lay, or Samuel is laying down here for us at even 98% obedience is still disobedience. We have to think about that for a moment because we rationalize it so much, right? I mean, if I was in school, CJ, if you got 98% on your pharmacy test, wouldn't you be good with that? If I got 98% in anything at school, I would take that as a dub. <laughs> so we rationalize and we tell ourselves, I'm 98% there with you, Lord. That's better than everybody else. That's rationalizing, by the way. Because 98% obedience is disobedience. By this time, Saul knows the jig is up. You might have guessed in the Ma and Paul Kettle show, the inspector does eventually discover that there's an old, dilapidated, almost falling down barn behind the fa that wonderful facade that's there. The, uh, they did have a real rainstorm, and it washed a lot of the paper and, and paint that they had built up to make it look so glamorous and grandeur. God is never not aware of what's going on underneath. And in His goodness and mercy, and oh, it's so uncomfortable, but in His goodness and mercy, He tells us it's not good. But do we not hear Him because we've built up a cocoon of a false narrative and we've rationalized so much. We've built up a facade that we actually believe the facade is real. Saul knows the jig is up. So verse 24. And this is what we read at the beginning. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. We talked about before, when Saul became king, Samuel was not giving up his priestly duties to Saul. Saul was now the civil authority for the nation of Israel. Saul was going to be the judge for matters of dispute and what have you. But the spiritual matters were still the, in the office occupied by Samuel, not Saul. So what's really going on here is Saul, he's not repenting. Saul wants to save face. For Samuel to not go with Saul to sacrifice and worship the Lord and have a great ceremony, a great after war party, this would have made Saul lose face. And that's what, what Saul was trying to save. He was trying to save this outside. He didn't care what was underneath. Saul constructed a narrative that excused his sin. It blamed others. And then he also convinced himself that he did a little something extra if he sacrificed or whatever, that he would be okay. Whatever it was that Saul constructed up into his mind, it was not God's Word. 
So what is this for us today? We all sin. And when we are confronted, we have a choice. Do I rationalize or do I repent? And I'm asking you, search your hearts today. Maybe it's not a sin issue. Maybe it's not a sin issue. Maybe the love for the Lord has diminished. Maybe you don't have the passion and the fire you once had before at the beginning. He tells us, Jesus tells us in Revelation to remember what it was like in the beginning and do those things. Maybe it's not a sin issue. Maybe you just need to get back to where you were with Him in the beginning. Because if you're living in a, in, in a point where your love for the Lord isn't what it was at the beginning, that's not a good place. And if there is something in your heart that the Lord is showing you, remember this verse, Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He's not just talking about a nap there. For Thanksgiving, I got to eat turkey, watch football, and take a nap. It was a wonderful Thanksgiving. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. The burden of sin is a heavy burden to carry. And He will forgive us if we seek Him and if we ask Him. 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that he's not here with the bat waiting for you to beat you in the head. But he's here, ready to forgive. The outside world will want to cancel you. But thank you, Jesus, in his presence I can be redeemed. Amen. Jeff and Nina, if you want to come up, I got, I got you in here late. I should have asked you here sooner, so you might want to run. <laughs> I have everybody close their eyes, and this is just a moment. Or you can spend with the Lord yourself. Maybe there's some things in, in your life that you've been tolerating a little bit and you've rationalized with yourself, but if you asked your question is, is God okay with it? And if the answer to that question is no, then don't leave today. Don't leave today without dealing with that. Don't, don't, don't build yourself up so much into a cocoon that you're more worried about what's going on on the outside than you are worried about what's going on on the inside. Because what's going on the outside doesn't matter. What's going on the outside is getting old. What's going on the outside is going to perish. What's going on on the outside is going to die. But what's going on on the inside is going to live forever. And you have a choice in the presence of God Almighty or away from Him. That's the choice we have before us. Don't try to save face. The altars are open. Join me at the altars and let's, let's pray. Let's seek Him. We, mean, we need to remember in this moment that God was not giving up on the man. We have to suffer consequences for decisions we make. But had Saul turned to the Lord, God would have forgiven him. He may not have been a king anymore, but he would have been forgiven. 
We need to know that. God isn't just going to take away the consequences for some of our choices. But He forgives us every time we ask Him to. Every time. Every time. Don't let the enemy lie to you. Don't, don't live in a facade. Let's not try to save face. Let's be open and honest with the Lord because He doesn't want, He doesn't want our rationale. He wants our repentance. So let's seek Him. Let's seek Him above all else. Brother Rick Parrott, would you come? Um, some of you guys may not know this, but uh, in our business meeting, actually, Rick has been working on this for a long time. <laughs> Through no fault of his own, COVID came, a couple other things came up and, and what have you, but Rick uh, has, has been put forth as a trial deacon. And his leadership speaks for itself. There isn't anything that Rick and his family are not involved in. Men's ministry, children's ministry, youth, you name it. Trunk or treat, food co-op, whatever it is that we need, they are there. Backup camera operator. Backup camera. Back I mean, whatever it is they need or we need, they are there. And, and it was earlier in September, and we, we, in a business meeting, we uh, set him forth. We took the training wheels off. <laughs> He's a full-fledged deacon. And so we wanted to uh, take an opportunity before his family. And uh, I have some of the elders, Rick West and Rick Newson, come forward. And I'm going to have you come over here. And then after we pray for him, I want his family to come up. And we'll pray with you guys. But we wanted to, to have a, a moment to where we would um, ceremonially send him forth yes. with prayer in the right way. Yes. Right? With oil and all. Amen. And, 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 yeah. <laughs> Take a bath. But no, that's all right. We won't do that. Father God, we just thank Lord you for God, our brother. Their brother today, Lord, 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 in your eyes Lord, right Lord, now, Jesus, we just want to send Lord, our brother Lord, Rick forth, Lord. Lord. Jesus, this, We're so grateful uh, for him and his Lord, leadership, Lord, 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 his leadership for his family. We're thankful for his family and their leadership, dear Lord. We know that you you see their works, and we know that you have blessed him and his family. And we thank you, dear God, for blessing us with him and his family. I pray that you would guide his steps, Father. Father, that you would give him wisdom and strength, that you would help him know which way to go, dear Lord, as he seeks you. He knows he will always be on the right path. Pray, dear God, that you will help him keep his eyes set upon you, always, dear God, and forever in your precious holy name. We thank you, Jesus. Gala and Grace, come forward, please. And we'll have you guys step down here. And anybody else who would want to come up, all our prayer partners, if we say a prayer over this family. Anyone who desires to have an office is a good thing. Yes. It's a heavy responsibility. Yes. And we know that the enemy would love nothing more than to tear them down. So we want to pray for protection over them and for... Uh, the Spirit to anoint them in, in all that they do. Let's pray for them. Father God, we just thank you for the Parrot family. We lift them up to you, Lord. Right now, we just ask in your precious holy name that your Spirit would reside upon them on grace, dear God, and everything that she puts her hands to, Lord. Rick, dear God, and Gala, and everything that she puts her hand to, Lord. I pray that you will bless their hands and their feet, dear God, that their lips would be seasoned with goodness, dear Lord. Lord, that they would lift people up, that they would be a light, dear Lord. In this dark world, we need more lights. And so, Lord, I pray that you will protect this bright light, Lord. Let it shine bright for you wherever they go. Guide their steps, dear God. Give them a straight path, and we thank you. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise in your precious holy name.
Everybody say, God bless the parrots. Amen. God not only sees the sparrow, he sees the parrots. Was that a bad dad joke? Oh. <laughs> it was biblical. <laughs> ah, amen. Well, what a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Did, uh, did the word step on your toes today too? Yeah. Yeah, me too. I have to go home and soak my feet now. A few announcements here before we get out. Uh, this Wednesday is the volunteer meeting and meal. If you lead ministry, volunteer in ministry, want to work in ministry, please come on this Wednesday. There'll be no, um, there'll be no uh, adult Bible study. I don't know about children's ministries or anything. No children's ministries either. Uh, I forgot one thing I wanted to mention. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about our bus ministry that we're getting ready to get started with, with our brother Brian Lyle back there. We need bus drivers, we need attendants, we need teachers. If you feel the heart, the Lord pulling on your heart to be involved in this some way, we need drivers. We, we actually, I need all of you, okay? I need, let me just be honest and just say I need every single one of you. Please come Wednesday. We'll give you food. We'll, we'll feed you. Come Wednesday and get some of the details. Um, this, is, this is needed. The enemy wants the children. We know that. We see it on the news. They belong to him. They belong to him. Will we go get them? Will we go get them? If you feel the Lord pulling on your heart and you want to be involved in some way, and don't, don't worry, it's not, if you come in, now you, we, we, we make you sign your name and blood and you're there for life. It's not like that. You will, you will have freedom to be here and to worship the Lord and do all of that, but we need workers. We need all of you. So if you would, come, come Wednesday. We'll feed you and we'll talk about the bus ministry. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, Thursday, December the 1st at 10 a.m., prayer meeting, room 103 down the East Hallway. Saturday, December 3rd, 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, young adults get together at Sweet Tea's Coffee Shop. Saturday, Steph or Kendra, one or the other, give us an update on December 3rd, what you need still, and how we're progressing. Yeah, absolutely. That's 50 families from the community that we just prayed about this morning. So let's come and let's, let's minister to people. Uh, Saturday, December 10th is the 55 plus Christmas banquet. You still have time to sign up if you haven't. Um, and uh, I'm going to let Sister Susan speak to parts of this, but Beverly's got the menu ready. We've got the games ready. We've got... Um, I've got all the, we got all the gifts ready. I mean, it's going to be a great time. So if you want to come or invite somebody who's not associated to our church, man, have them come, get them signed up. It's going to be a great time. Susan?
Thank you, Sister Susan. And also, if you're serving, working that night, we will feed you as well. The, uh, Beverly is planning on feeding all of the service, so, and you won't want to miss that because she's a great cook. Um, Crystal, can you give us an update on December the 11th, the winter care packages? Yeah, um, it's it's a lot of fun. It's just a lot of fun. Um, I've I've been privileged enough to go and deliver, and it's it's just a lot of fun. So you'll enjoy that. Anything else that we missed? Yeah. Anita, wait, wait, just a minute. Our Christmas program is also December eighteenth. So bring your family and friends. December the eighteenth, Christmas program. Bring your family and friends. It's a great time to minister to your family. Eleven thirty Friday. Eleven thirty, mom's kitchen. Mom's kitchen. Thank you. I was trying to get all the details into my head. Did I miss anything? Would you bow your heads? God, we are full today of joy, and we're so thankful that true joy, true peace, true happiness comes from Christ. And Lord, we rest in that today. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of repentance. Um, it truly is a gift from God. Thank you, Lord, that in repentance you restore. And God, that you, you want to redeem. That's your character. You want to redeem. And Father, we're grateful for that today. As we leave here, Father, I pray that you would help us to hold tight to your hand, to walk where you walk, to speak what you speak, to behave in whatever behaviors, Lord, you give us to to do. I pray, God, walk with us this week. Help us to do what we need to do, Lord, to get things done. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.